Park here. I bet you're cranking out more content now than ever, and it's important that it converts customers. But chances are, unless you are intentionally telling stories, you're probably not being heard. So I'm excited to announce our first public Business of Story Masterclass and Deliberate Practice program starting Thursday, June 6, 2019, right here in Phoenix, Arizona. In our half-day hands-on session that kicks off the program, you'll learn the applied science and bewitchery of storytelling and how to hack the core consciousness of your audiences. During the following seven weeks, we're going to use the Thinkific online platform to deliver you a storytelling assignment every week on Monday that you will apply immediately in your brand or business. We'll share with you the frameworks that are proven to help you clarify your story, amplify your impact, and simplify your life. We'll even have a private Facebook group so you can learn from and grow with your fellow Business of Story students. So if you'd like to captivate your audiences and elevate yourself, your business, and your people, Visit businessofstory.com right now and reserve your seat. We only have a limited number of spots available in this very select cohort of storytellers. So pause this episode and save your place right now. Oh, and don't forget to come back because we have a marvelous show for you today. I thought it was just a stupid picture of a pig in the ocean. But after hearing that story, I had to have it. Now I wasn't just buying a picture. I was buying a story. Story literally made the picture worth more money to me. That's what businesses are about. People buy brands. People buy stories much more than anything else. I work with a lot of big enterprise companies, but let's just say I always tell folks, drop the PowerPoint, close your laptops, start with your story. If you want people to get engaged and you want people to act, you have to tell them an emotionally powerful story. That's with great characters, it's with uncertain outcomes, and it's with high stakes and drama. All business strategy is a story. Welcome back to Business of Story. Park Howell here, and we have a healthy show for you today. And what I mean by that, we have a very interesting cat from Woodstock, New York. Uh, with us, a gentleman that uh, we got acquainted through social media marketing world in 2018, so a year ago, and then uh, worked on his brand story around nutritionals and supplements. And we finally got to sit down across from each other this past social media marketing world in San Diego. We just had such a great time chatting. His story has come together amazingly, and I invited him to come to the show to share his journey and how he approached his storytelling with you so you can apply it to your brand. And why it's important is all of us, regardless of age, are running around trying to be healthy and the activities we do for the most part, the diets we have, our exercise and health supplements and sometimes pharmaceuticals are a part of that program. But the real big problem is there's a lot of nonsense a lot of misinformation, a lot of, you know, right out lying in both sides of that coin, the pharmaceutical industry and the health supplement nutritional industry. Therefore, our guest today, Neil Smoller, founder of Woodstock Vitamins and a holistic pharmacist, will take us through what he's learned in his nearly two decades experience working in the pharmaceutical world and then seeing a lot of the same ills happening in the nutritional world and how he's brought those two worlds together to be what I love, uh, the no quackery horseshit guaranteed guy to (laughs) go to, to learn about your health needs through both pharmaceuticals and nutritionals. Neil, welcome to the Business of Story. Hi, Park. Thanks for having me. And uh, that is quite an... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> introduction <laughs> for a podcast. Uh, I can't believe that you uh, you actually dropped the swear word in there. That's great. I love it. I should use it more often. I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. I don't. I don't necessarily lean on those. But when you and I were uh, talking prior to social media marketing world, and you were sharing me how your story was developed, that was one of those little lines that was kind of in between the seams. And yeah. yes, it might not be something that you put at the top of your website. But you know what? 
it tells a story. And I think we have all suffered from the quackery on both the pharmaceutical side of life and the nutritional side of life when all we really want to do is find stuff that works for us and keeps us and our loved ones healthy. So I just love your no-nonsense approach to it. I agree. I think it's important to use the correct words when we're discussing these things. And saying something so outright like that really is an attention getter. You'd only want to use it selectively. But I'm the kind of pharmacist that curses for my patients. You know, uh, I've told people in the past, uh, you know, if you take this antibiotic, don't trust a fart. You know, so sometimes those things are, are the the stories that we tell our our, our patients. Uh, we can use these words to really register and really drive a message home. And I think it needs to be. Set with the supplement industry. You know, I'm a fan of it. I, I love supplements. That's half of my income is from supplement sales. But the natural product industry, as we've discussed, and as you just pointed out, is not what we think it is. And that's my mission is to make people more aware, but then give them the opportunity and the options to use it in the best way possible. And first and foremost, you are a pharmacist, right? I mean, when you, you yeah. edit, why don't you take us to your backstory and how yeah. did you get to become a holistic pharmacist? So I grew up in a small town in uh, Saugerties, New York, just a town over from where I am now in Woodstock. And I did not know what I wanted to be. I knew that I wanted to be in the health and wellness field for sure. My mother was a nurse and I really took to it. I took one of those silly little tests that they do in home economics class, and it said, hey, you should be a pharmacist. And I said, oh, yeah. And I thought to myself of my pharmacist, my community pharmacist, his name was Pete Gage. So I got a job at the local independent pharmacy and fell in love. I actually didn't apply to any other colleges except for the pharmacy college in Albany, right next to our hometown, you know, about an hour away. And I went to a six-year training. Uh, I've got a doctorate degree in pharmacy. And I tried every which way to become a pharmacist, and I never really found home until I kind of got the, you know, the itch to be more entrepreneurial and, and open up my own practice. And where better to do so but my hometown? That uh, hometown pharmacy that Pete had worked at, who you know he happened to also be my neighbor growing up, which was you know small town stuff, right? So that pharmacy had closed because the economics around pharmacy and independent pharmacy had changed over time. So they were a right aid. So I approached Pete and said, uh, "Listen, let's do this, man. Let's uh, open up our own practice. Let's bring Beatles Pharmacy, was the name of the pharmacy, back to life." And uh, so that's where I started my entrepreneurial journey in pharmacy. And, you know, I just got super duper frustrated because my patients were taking four, five, 10, 15 different medications to treat disease. And, and I would say to them, listen, like you can come off of these medicines. You don't have to be on them. These aren't life sentences. These are things that you can make better life choices and get off these medications. So, you know, the thing is, is that nutrition holistic approaches, supplements are all a part of our training as pharmacists. It's all what we do. Every time we talk about any disease, we start with the lifestyle things, the things that we can do, not what we can take. But it seems to me that the, the actual practice of it is more lip service than anything. You know, oh, make sure you exercise. You know, that's what the doctor says. Oh, make, yeah, you, you can try some vitamin C, right? So it's, it, nobody really is committing to doing this stuff correctly. And the general approach for traditional practitioners like us is vitamins are to sell and not to take. That's what one of my professors told me in school. And so, you know, I'm looking at this whole thing and I'm saying, there's got to be a better way. Like I've seen supplements work in people. And I know that if you make better lifestyle choices, you can get these drugs off. And the people that were really up for it and really up for that challenge, the, uh, you know, we had great success with them. Okay, so you were there as a pharmacist, you were fulfilling the marching orders of the doctors that are telling your customers, here, you got to be on this and you got to be on this and here's a prescription for that. And we've all been there when we go in for our health screening or we go in for an ailment. And next thing you know, you got three different prescriptions. You're running into Walgreens or you know, Rite Aid or... Yeah, wherever the vomit of the pharmacist is, right? Those guys that are so mean in the back and your, <laughs> your prescription will be three hours. You know, you know why it takes three hours for CVS to fill your prescription? I think it's 
it's because they try to like throw the pills in the bottle from across the the counter. Like that's what they're doing. There. <laughs> they're shooting hoops. Uh, yeah, shooting hoops in the back. Yeah. So yeah, and and you go to these pharmacies and you get your four or five prescriptions, and that's just the breaks. The when it when you get a disease that requires medication, it may require multiple medications, and if you have multiple diseases, you're going to be on quite a handful of medicine. So you were there, and I mean, is it your job to caution them not to take some of these medications that you are essentially second-guessing their doctor's instructions? So I would say that it can be perceived that way. I guess it depends on the doctor's mood at the time (laughs) when uh, the patient goes back to them. But I think that we've always tried to approach it in a manner that says a pharmacist's role in the modern uh, medical world is to ensure that a medication is appropriate. Mm -hmm. We are constantly working to get people on the lowest effective dose of the least medications. And so I think that's just part of the overall strategy. Now, a doctor wants uh, results. They, they don't want liability. So they don't want people going off of medications when it's not appropriate. So we had to uh, earn that trust by getting results. Yeah. And, 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 and that's, that's what we were able to do. And, that, and then, so, so then we took, you know, what we had and we, and we moved to the next town over and we opened up this holistic practice where we gave people the best of both worlds is what we said at the beginning. I want to kind of unpack this and backtrack just a little bit. So what was it? Take us to that moment when you were a kid and you said you were working at the pharmacy and something happened that said, yes, this is what I want to do. What was that? Can you take us to that day, that afternoon or whatever happened? Yeah, I think it. what it was was the um, sheer vastness of the knowledge, the connection with the patients, but more importantly, the role in the community. I think it was just such a great fusion of those three things. And did something happen? Uh, you know, on a moment that like, wow, when it all came together for you to realize that? I just think watching my mentors in that pharmacy interact with people and just seeing the power that I could have as a trusted, accessible uh, member of the healthcare community, just seeing what that was. I think that was really just it. It was more the whole picture versus any individual story. Yeah. So it started then with uh, dispensing drugs and being a pharmacist, but then it grew into more of this nutritional side after you, what, kind of awakened to uh, what was happening in the industry? And and I think it's more just when you're a pharmacist. So like we we go to school and we learn all of this great information, especially my degree. I have have the six-year PharmD, the doctorate degree. It's a clinical-based degree. So we're learning about managing diseases and treatment algorithms and all this stuff. And then you go to a pharmacy, even the one that I own, and you're just counting pills. You know, you're just taking the script and you're making sure that you don't write it wrong. And then you bill an insurance and you count pills. So it's kind of like my, you know, drive to always look beyond this current situation and how can we improve? How can we make this, this better for people? And just kind of, again, looking at the whole picture and saying, dude, this person's taking 15 meds. This isn't right. Like, you could just literally stop drinking Pepsi and, you, and you'll be fine, you know? <laughs> so. So when was that moment then when you were in the pharmacy working your business and growing it in your your hometown that Mm -hmm. you realized that I've got to branch out? I've got to actually play both sides of this coin, the pharmaceutical side and the nutritional side. Yeah, I think that the the moment was when I realized that my attitude around supplements as a, a valid option in the treatment algorithms when it was when I realized that they could be such a, a, a solid option because, you know, they're always dismissed in our traditional training. So like when I would see people using supplements and being able to use that uh, paired with their lifestyle modifications to, to manage their diseases, I, I said, hey, there's something here, despite what everybody says, despite what every doctor's ever told me, what every professor's ever told me, there's something here. So we have to dig into it. And we, what we really have to do is we have to bring what's best about a pharmacy and a pharmacist into the natural products world because they don't have the expertise that we have, the people that sell supplements. There's just some teenager at a grocery store that's making recommendations about this stuff. So it's, it's looking at what the supplement industry was outside of my bubble and realizing, dude, this, this has to get fixed. This is a problem. 
you take more than three supplements, they're going to interact with each other. Nobody is equipped to deal with that on the hand-to-hand combat level. You know, my patients going to a health food store and taking supplements that could potentially interact and then not telling me about it. So it's kind of all of this stuff whirling around that kind of, you know, started knocking around in my head a little bit and, and made me say, you know what, we, we can do this better. We can, we can be the change that we want to see. And when you graduated with your doctorate in pharmacy and you got your, your own pharmacy up and running, were you doubtful or didn't really think much about the nutritional side or were you dismissive of it for a while? So, of course, I was. I was very dismissive of it, uh, especially because at that time, the re- regulations around supplements were still very, very weak. Like today, I would say they're mediocre. They were like almost non existent uh, way back when. So, the product variability was a huge issue from a therapeutic standpoint. There was very little clinical evidence. And again, like who's hawking this stuff? It's, it's, unqualified professional. So I definitely took a very cynical look at the supplement industry. And it was only until we had some like of these like needles in the haystack that we were finding, you know, that uh, really kind of said, hey, there might be something to this. Yeah. And you are operating in an industry, the pharmaceutical industry, who's their lobbyists, according to Statista, a 2017 report invested $279.57 million in lobbying efforts in Washington, D.C. And the next closest one is the insurance industry at 160. Right. So nutritionals don't stand a chance against that because they don't have the money to go and proof themselves out through the FDA and whatever. And you could you know, argue that the pharmaceutical industry has a lock on it just purely through the regulatory side. So that also then sets up the charlatans and the nutritional side to come out and make you know, their own claims and get away with it for as long as they can until somebody shuts them down. But it also limits really good nutritionals to coming on the market. Well, that's one of the things that I do with my current brand is to actually point out that dichotomy that we have, that one that you're painting the picture of doesn't actually exist. So let me take one step back and talk about what you were saying around the pharmaceutical industry, because that's enough to make you want to vomit. The, mm-hmm. the, the pharmaceutical industry is sick. It's broken. It's corrupt. We understand that completely. The, the amount of money that they spend to keep their products at the top, that is a real, real issue. And at, so at the same time, we have this pendulum swinging in this country where people trust less the traditional establishment because of all of this corruption as it comes to light with the internet and, and all of the stuff being you know, put out in the wild. So we say, oh my goodness, the big pharma is the devil. You know, and we don't want to take medicines because they're poison. And so I'm going to then, the obvious solution the story we tell ourselves is, well, then the natural products industry is where I want to go. And what I try to tell people is that they're both jerks. The natural products industry has lobbyists. They have drug reps that go to the practitioners, quote unquote, that sell supplements and they grease them up, grease their palms, take them out to dinner, and they get them to sell their supplements. The corporations that own most of the brands that we buy in, in supplement stores are mega corporations. Most of them are pharmaceutical companies right? Mm -hmm. Pfizer, I believe, is still the the main supplier of raw materials to the natural product industry. So the idea that it's big pharma versus the natural product industry is a false battle between quote unquote good and evil that really shouldn't exist. And that's what I've been trying to say uh, is is that we can't throw the baby out with the bathwater, can't cut the nose off to spite our face. We have to make better decisions using the best of both of those worlds, knowing that both of those groups and those organizations are corrupt. Well, we need them both because we, there are pharmaceuticals that we need to take that, uh, that do work for us. And there are nutritionals that will help us. So of course, it goes back to your no quackery horseshit guarantee. Yeah. <laughs> Let's talk about that. So you've yeah. got this attitude that you are bringing to this that I love. It's very refreshing and it's, it's no holds barred, no BS. Um, yes. Where does that come from and how has it started to materialize in your own brand story? Yeah. I mean, so the first thing is I'm in Woodstock. 
right? I'm, yeah. I wear jeans. I've got sneakers on. I don't wear a tie, right? I'm a different kind of pharmacist. I have a t-shirt that I sell uh, to tourists because Woodstock's a big tourist town. And I give to my patients that say, my pharmacy is where aging hippies get their drugs, right? So I have this normal loud mouth kind of uh, persona that's always gotten me in trouble in the past. So I figure let's try to hone this for good. <laughs> try to try to use this for something. So my attitude and, and my sense of humor kind of comes out in the message that I'm trying to deliver because I feel it's always been the most efficient way for me to educate the customers. You know, a pharmacist's role is to take very complex things and, and break them down so uh, lay people can understand them. Again, I, there's mostly artists that come here. You know, they don't understand drug interactions and how the, the biology of, of, of the body, right? And those people are the ones that are most susceptible to the quackery because as long as it sounds good to them, then they'll be the first ones to subscribe to something that logically makes sense, even though medically or clinically it does not work that way. So, you know, so that's where, where it comes from. It comes from my natural sense of like, listen, we got to, we got to bring down the, the formalities here. We have to try to uh, meet our patients, not uh, across the counter, but around the counter and, and, and educate and inform them to understand that these people will feed them these stories that are not accurate, but at the same time, listen and, and help them reach their health goals using both sides of the coin. So in your story, what can we learn? What can our listeners who are not pharmacists, uh, but yeah. they are working on their own brand story and trying to bring it to life and really differentiate themselves in the world, what can they learn from what you've experienced in how you've made this evolution out of just being a pharmacist into this holistic pharmacist that really balances the best of both worlds while trying to dampen the negativity of both worlds? Yeah. So I think that was the thing that I really like grabbed your arm about at the first social media marketing world, because I, I sat through your, your class and I was doing the ABT thing in my head and I just kept realizing I kept going negative. Like I just kept starting it out. Oh, the, the natural product industry is broken you know, and mm -hmm. like negative, 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 but I'm not negative about the natural product industry. I'm a, a fan of it. I just wish that like things would change. So the standards would be raised and, and we couldn't have all of this misinformation and lies and propaganda for people. I want them to use it. So it it's really kind of taking a step back and trying to frame and reframe. It is exactly who you are from conversations that you have with the people that are the closest to you. And I think that was the, the, the struggle for me was really saying, so who, who am I? The existential crisis. So who am I? And I'm trying to market and, and build my business without first identifying my own story. From my perspective, if somebody is going through this process, I think you really need to pump the brakes and you need to do this first and foremost. The story needs to be built out first. And it starts on your story is what you're saying is really yes. understand who you are and yeah. why you're doing what you're doing and how is it being expressed through your brand and are you expressing it authentically at the moment? And I think like that is it in a nutshell, because it, it's really the, the, I look at the evolution of my business mind and my entrepreneurial journey. And it's always been, I'm trying to be something different. Like I really wanted to be the business guy that just owned a bunch of businesses. And I was more like setting the vision for the company and then like cheerleading and, and making everybody do the job. But then at the ground level, it was the people building those relationships. And as I, you know, evolve and as the economy changes, and, and the way that we do business changes, I realized that this is really about me. The people that would come to all of those businesses if I had four or 10 uh, independent pharmacies are coming because my story is propagating down into the individual employees that I have there. So the problem was, wasn't was you know the operational stuff. It was that the, the story of who I was and who the business should be and, and what we should be doing wasn't clarified completely. And and I, I think as I've like learned these lessons from, you know, people like yourself, I, I've realized that it, it really comes down to uh, understanding who you really are and who you really want to be in this world. Yeah, because even in the pharmacy world, people buy from people they like, right? Now, so you're a commodity just like I am, just like every one of these listeners are out there until we 
truly define our differentiation in our authentic story. So you're another guy selling supplements and you're another guy selling drugs, but what they're really buying is Neil's passion, interest, knowledge about balancing these two worlds of the pharmaceutical world and the nutritional world and doing it in a very no-nonsense way. Right. And you know what I just thought of while you, you said this? I don't think I've ever had this thought cross my mind. I think I took the story for granted. Like the, in my situation, because it's an independent pharmacy, the story was there. You know, the story is already there. It's this is the hometown pharmacy. This is the hometown pharmacist. This is what the experience will be. And I just kind of like fit into that. And I crafted it and, and, and kind of changed it. But I, I kind of took for granted that I even needed a story because it was just kind of, I'm the hometown guy and I'm doing the hometown stuff, you know, uh, in, in the way that people are familiar with. And it wasn't really until I, I, I ventured out into this new world where people didn't know me, people didn't know my community that I really, I really started to, to drill down on, on who exactly I was. And yeah, and the, the no nonsense approach is what's required because there's so much fluff and BS out there. Dude, like everybody's trying to be unique, but they're all being the same. And so, you know, like if I look at the health and wellness Instagram dorks, I would call them like, because you know, they, they're all out there. If you're a guy, you've got a beard, you got a high and tight and you're like working out in a gym. Right. And then, then there's the girl doing a yoga pose in a bikini. Like that's what the health and wellness space was. So I looked at myself and I said, dude, I'm not any of those guys. I'm uniquely me. I'm uniquely like a, a slightly overweight pharmacist that uses curse words when he talks to his patients. Like that's pretty unique, <laughs> you know, and what I'm saying about the supplement industry is very real. And, you know, the people that are putting down the supplement industry are doing so because they don't think there's any value there. But I think that there's tremendous value. And, and I'm trying to like, kind of like be that consumer advocate to wake people up. So. Well, and you bring the intellect and the knowledge and the studies of a pharmacist to it that says, you know, there is a way. So we created a brand this time last year and launched it called Heirloom. And it's mm -hmm. an all natural supplement for yeah. allergies. But yeah. we can't say allergies. I can say it on this podcast, but we can't right. say it in all of our work. Yeah. And it was created by someone from the medical industry who was trying to help his wife who was having horrible side effects to the medications given to her for her allergies. She woke up on the floor one day of the living room and said, honey, you're a smart guy. You've got to be able to help me. He went to Whole Foods, put together a bunch of different compounds after doing his studies that he learned how to understand this, of course, through his medical studies. And he created this marvelous supplement they tested for five years on her and family members and whatever and said, you know, we got to bring this to market because it will help you. Uh, and there are like zero side effects. And right. when I started reading about all the side effects of just over-the-counter uh, medications for allergies, I was blown away. And I saw in him and you, it's so funny because we all, you don't know him and I can't even reveal his name at this point, but you two came into my life at the exact same time and I essentially heard the exact same thing. Both came from very practiced, educated uh, medical pharmaceutical practitioners and said the system is messed up. And there are much better ways to do this through the natural realm. All, the problem with that is there are so many charlatans and natural products that don't work. Let us see if we can't meld these two worlds and actually bring you something that will work and not kill you in the process. Right. Uh, so right. Yeah. And and like so, what I I tell tell people because that that is the the picture that's painted is that natural products are safe and and prescription drugs are not because look at the big long list of side effects and I say okay all right yes true that is real but the thing that also is real is that the natural products industry aren't held to the same standards of reporting and study and if it were those side effects would be a lot longer with the natural product industry a lot of these compounds that are out there are just weaker versions of drugs. So they can definitely be used uh, in place of them. But I just try to caution people and say, yeah, you know, like, like his product, I'm sure is phenomenal. And I'm sure he's probably very thoughtful and responsible about how he's making it and, and obviously how he's marketing because he knows that he can't say that it's for allergies, of course. Mm -hmm. So so that's that's great, but it's just the when it's the lay people that are are consuming these products saying, well, I'd rather use this one because it's safer because there's no side effects. And the drug commercial on TV had 400 side effects worse than the actual disease. Like I just say, hey, you know, I'm just going to put the time out there called BS on that. 
you know, it's only because of the current system and the lack of regulations on the one side. We don't know if it's actually safer, um, and we have to still be wary of that. So. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Let's go back to your brand story. And you said it uh, after going through the session a year, year and a half ago now almost, it helped you with your brand story. What did you arrive at for your ABT? Is it top of mind? You have it written down? Yeah, so it's pretty much top of mind. I've been I've been uh, hawking it to all the local doctors around here, trying to see if it sticks. You know? <laughs> now you shouldn't be saying hawk and, and uh, the <laughs> nutritional industry in the same way. Right, room. exactly. Uh, yeah. Uh, so basically, I'm a practicing pharmacist for 15 years, and I've been using supplements and natural products to help people live healthier, happier lives. And I've seen the power of these uh, natural products and nutrition, but the natural products industry is sick. Product quality is poor and it varies wildly. Recommendations border on quackery and almost malpractice at times. Uh, the information that people use to research their uh, and and take the power into their own hands is straight up pop- propaganda, lies. Uh, it lacks scientific evidence. So I developed Woodstock Vitamins and the Vitality Approved Standards, which I believe you and I have agreed we're going to change it to the BS free or the no nonsense standards. We've identified what the ideal supplement in each category should look like based on real evidence, quality therapeutics, and we even consider stuff like business ethics. And we strive to sell supplements that meet or exceed these strict standards. We work very hard to deliver information and advice in a responsible, real way without the BS or the quackery. So we're, we're refining it. We're getting it. You know, like yeah. that, that's where we're at. I mean, that's beautiful to me. It's like music. Uh, <laughs> Park will help you make music. If, if <laughs> <laughs> Well, the powerful thing about the end button, therefore, is it gets you completely focused on what problem you're solving for. And folks, every brand, the only reason why you are in business is you're solving someone's problem and helping them get something that they can't get without you. The ABT is great because it sets up what that problem is you're solving for. So you might even boil down what I loved what you said there because it captures it in probably a hundred plus words. But I mean, you could boil it down to simply saying, yeah, I've been a practicing pharmacist for 15 years, and I can tell you the healthcare industry is sick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There are ways to overcome this with the right knowledge and, and experience and guidance. Therefore, I at you know, Woodstock Vitamins am putting together. You've identified the problem even right up top, and your butt actually works as just opposite of what that particular problem is, but there's actually a way around it. So right. you can use the ABT in two different ways. I like how you use it in, and always thinking about, can you invert that too once you get your brand story down? Because it just helps you sort of proof out the overall theme and what you're solving for in your brand story. Although in saying all that, I think I might've just made it more complicated because I'm kind of, my brain's kind of spitting. Yeah. You know what? It's, it's four o'clock on a Friday. So uh, that's- yeah, that's, and it is Friday. You <laughs> um, also did something I liked that I thought was pretty fun. Uh, you borrowed from Peter Piper pizza. I think it was, and you said, you know, what, what do they say? Better pizza, better something. Better. Yes. It was like uh, probably one of those pizza guys that are like making too many waves politically. I'm sure. Yeah. But, yeah well, the, he yeah, is. Yeah. The, uh, the uh, better recommend, uh, better products, better recommendations, better information. Mm -hmm. That was like one of the things that we were testing out too and trying to deliver the, you know, because there are in my mind, those are the three major problems with the supplement industry that, and the thing is, is like, how do I communicate to somebody that everything's broken? You know, they come in for vitamin C and then I I throw this, this thing at them. So Mm -hmm. how do I concisely say that? So, you know, or, you know, even position myself as the solution to that problem. So, you know, better products, better advice, better information. And I think that really covers the base of what, what I am and what I'm trying to do. And then you deliver on that through a number of different channels. You've got a blog at woodstockvitamins.com. You've got a blog. You've got a podcast that you're just is just kicking that off, or has that been up just and running for a little bit? Just kicking it off. I've got seven, eight episodes in the can, and I just started like interviewing people. And like the podcast is the coolest thing ever. If you uh, have listeners out there that are thinking, mm, I'm thinking about doing a podcast, absolutely 100% do a podcast. Even if your content is horrible, I just think like so many people are excited to be on podcasts that you'll get so many guests and people talking to you that, in, at least in my experience, wouldn't talk to me anyway. I mean, I'm calling straight up uh, like universities and hospitals and I'm saying, hey, can I talk to your chief medical blah, blah, blah. I, I want them on the podcast to talk about sleep. 
you know? And oh yeah, absolutely. That guy wouldn't talk to me. Otherwise I'm some, <laughs> I'm some pharmacist from Woodstock, you know? So just the fact that I have this podcast where I can, you know, let really let the personality fly. I think, I think that's a, a huge win from, you know, st telling your story, but again, being hyper-focused on what it is that you're trying to do. So I'm not just going to randomly have a bunch of people on, I'm going to have a bunch of people on and have them relate to what I'm trying to communicate, which is the misinformation in the supplement yeah. industry. Well, let me ask you then, because we get inundated with requests to be on the show, which is awesome. I'm really, really proud of that. We've, mm -hmm. you know, are ranked now among the top 10% of downloaded podcasts in the world. So that makes me very there proud of business's story. And mm -hmm. um, I'm top 10% in the store. Like definitely like no other people in my stores has a podcast that's downloaded as much as mine. So that's good. There you go. <laughs> there you go. But what happens, and this is where you'll have to get really clear on it and you may already be there, but but what I tell people is, look, innumerable podcasts that cover SEO and they cover entrepreneurship and they cover waking up in the morning and the five you know, <laughs> best habits and blah, blah, blah. I said, mm -hmm. I am about bringing people on that will help our listeners clarify their stories to amplify their impact and simplify their life. So I'm always, always looking for people that are story focused, story based. They don't have to be, you know, story gurus, but they're people right. like you that are using story to help you first understand your own personal narrative, but then to drive that focused mission of your brand so that you can have that impact and you can actually simplify your life by saying no to all the things that do not service or honor the journey you're on. So your show, your podcast at, at Woodstock Vitamins, what is your core focus on that show that people cannot get anywhere else in the world? <laughs> so I say wellness, weed, and Woodstock. <laughs> there you go. Those are the three things that we focus on. But really, the, the idea here is to root out and bring to light misinformation in all the different disciplines in health and wellness talk about the marijuana industry as it relates to the entire wellness picture, because that is going to be a huge player in how we treat disease uh, and uh, new diseases that will come just as a result of it. And then, of course, celebrating the craziness that is this town here, Woodstock, New York. You know, the idea of, of really kind of talking about um, how each industry and how everyone is is dealing with the misinformation that's out there. Um, that's actually what I, I do. I, I learned this at the social media marketing world from a, a young lady who does Western podcasts. So the whole rodeo culture, she asks everybody, what's your biggest pet peeve or, or what's your advice from the road? You know, what's your, you know, your Western advice. So I tell people, ask people now, what's your biggest pet peeve about the natural products industry? And so that's then sets the whole conversation, the whole tone for the conversation right from the get go about what's wrong with the system and like how their world relates to it and what they have to deal with. So that's what I focus on. Well, that's awesome. So here's how our two worlds have intersected, not just on this show, but there's a gentleman that I mentioned to you when we were in San Diego that you really should get on your show. He's amazing. His name is Michael Backus. I've got, yeah, I've got his name right in front of me, actually, with your notes here. <laughs> yeah, he wrote uh, Cannabis Pharmacy, The Practical Do Guide to Medical Marijuana. And his story is fascinating because he came out of the Hollywood world, worked with Michael Crichton and Jurassic Park and these sorts of things. He's an absolutely brilliant mind. He covers a lot of different areas, including um, AI and marijuana. What happened with him is he was suffering intense uh, migraine headaches and just couldn't, couldn't overcome them and was not a pot smoker, even, you know, <laughs> being a screenwriter and that is a story consultant in Hollywood. And he started doing his own studying and found out, you know, that, that, and I'm going to blow this up, the cannabinoid or what's, what's the, the cannabinoid. Thank you. Cannabinoid system with that. We automatically or naturally make this in our brain. And when it's out of whack, that it can lead to, uh, to you know, migraines and whatever. And so he started testing this and found that cannabis, marijuana did indeed help him reduce and in some cases eliminate his, his migraines. Wrote this book back Mm, I'm not even sure when it came out, maybe two decades ago, decade and a half ago, but it has been one of the most read, you know, resourced books since then. And I had him on my show, show number 144, a really fascinating guy that I think your listeners would love Absolutely. to hear from. He's brilliant. 
Yeah, versus like a local guy that grows pot, you know. So yeah, we, I would love to have somebody on like that. I, when you first mentioned the Jurassic Park, I'm like, what did he get the Raptors high? Like I don't understand. <laughs> what is there? This dude is brilliant, man. He will yeah. blow your mind. I've got to get him back on the show because I want to talk to him more. We touched just a little bit on AI, artificial intelligence, and I was. This le- also leads to a question I have for you. Um, mm-hmm. I just finished the Homo Deus book by Harari. And he wrote Sapiens, a really fascinating history about Homo sapiens and our ability to tell stories and how we become the most aggressive, invasive species on the planet, primarily yeah. because we can create these imagined realities through our storytelling brains. And, you know, it's where we are today. But AI is becoming so, you know, we are, we are freely feeding the AI engine by every time we, you know, log into Google and we give our pant sizes and we, you know, uh, we give them our information that in his most recent book, he said one of the biggest disruptions that AI is going to bring may well be in the pharmaceutical business. That, Hmm. as you said at the top of the show, you know, I got into it for all these wonderful reasons of being the you know, go to trusted, accessible guy in society. And then I found really I'm the guy counting pills back there. And so his argument is, well, if we give AI all of our DNA and it gets to look at that strand throughout all of our you know, relationships and our families and we are sick, can't it do a better job of predicting what compounds in both pharmaceutical and nutritional um, that we should be taking and then therefore send that order in it gets made there and is just handed off to us and all of a sudden the pharmacist is completely out of the picture they're not needed anymore I can't wait. I hope I hope that I get to not work anymore. I hope AI takes over tomorrow. Are you kidding me? <laughs> Do you see that as being a potential? So here's here's my opinion on it. There's two things that I see. So the first thing is I don't think that we're that complicated. A lot of these like uh, quackery businesses have propped up that um, in the natural products industry that test you to determine which vitamins you need, and they're trying to kind of play on that that story that the idea of us being so unique and fragile beings and we have individual needs. That's not really the case. We're pretty much all the same guy or gal, you know, and, and so our body systems work in a very, very consistent manner. And yeah, there might be individual variabilities, but not anything that would be truly clinically relevant. So I feel like the AI taking over from that perspective is not something that we really need to worry about. I I don't think that uh, medicine will go in that route. I think, you know, for the complicated disease, is like cancers and and such like the immunotherapy is kind of proving that there's a level of sophistication for certain in illnesses and diseases but not for general health you know it's pretty much the same thing eat a salad stop uh, smoking and and run a little bit and and you'll have a, a great life expectancy with minimal diseases and that's what I try to tell everyone the boogeymen now are the, the heart disease diabetes Alzheimer's cancer mm-hmm. you know those are the boogeymen and that's what they use to scare you to make you think that you're going to have one of those things, which are horrible things. And so you need this supplement, you need this this uh, pharmaceutical, and it really comes down to making healthy lifestyle choices to to mitigate your risk. I mean, I think the MIND diet, which is an Alzheimer's diet, I, I think it's like a risk reduction of near 40% is what the Alzheimer's Association says. So just eating more fish on a regular basis and, and reducing simple sugars can have this tremendous risk. So I don't really see AI as being disruptive in, in like the general population and general diseases. Here's where I see AI being disruptive, especially in the business world. Um, what I see is like these chat bots, right? The, mm-hmm. These chat bots and Alexa and all of this, right? That, that's what I see as being the most, most disruptive thing because what is the commodity in the business? We've just been talking about it. It's me. It's I'm the story. It, it's, it's all about me and the personal connection. Well, what if I was able to bottle that up and, and turn that into an algorithm that my chat box emulates? So somebody comes into my store and asks me, which fish oil should I buy? Or, or tell me about fish oil. There's there's uh, only a few dozen different scripts that I would go with, you know, to, to work that person through the process. Now, imagine if that's bottled up and put online, you wouldn't even need me anymore. So I see AI being disruptive in that, like, um, it'll, it'll almost eliminate that because the, all of our products have become commoditized, right? So mm-hmm. that my biggest struggle here is do I sell supplements? 
to people? Or do I teach other people who are struggling with this supplement expertise and teach them how to do supplements better? Because trying to sell a product with Amazon around is impossible. You know, How do you break into a market, especially something that's hyper competitive? So if all of our products are commoditized, just wait until Amazon learns how I think as, as uh, you know, and then it's be like, oh, I'm going to go to the, the, the Dr. Oz uh, uh, supplement advice channel, or I'm going to go to the, the rock has his own supplement advice channel. And that's where I'm going to get my supplement advice from. And I'm going to punch in the numbers and it's going to uh, spit out a pill that I get to take. So that's where I see AI being the most disruptive. And I don't know if I'm just a tinfoil hat guy and maybe it's too much of the, the reefer smoke in Woodstock. I don't know, but you know, that's, that's, that's what I, <laughs> I see. I don't think it. you are. I mean, when I was I was watching CNN the other night, and four out of the five commercials right in a row were commercials about, look, at we can create your perfect genes for you guys that can't get genes to fit. Just send us, you know, we'll download our app, scan your butt, uh, mm-hmm. send it in, and we're going to create these great genes. Well, then it goes on to, I can't remember what the next ones were, but every single of those four out of five, we're asking you to share the data about you. Yeah. Wherever and you so park, feeding, you don't even have to try on glasses. You can just put your face up right? and then, and then now they have a whole database of our faces, yeah. you know, and they know all our different sizes of our faces. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm getting creeped out already. I don't know. Okay. Maybe we should change the, the topic. Let's pop <laughs> out of the, the creepy rabbit hole of AI at this point, but it does make a very good point is here you are with woodstockvitamins.com where just the name of it says, I'm going to go here to buy vitamins, but you lead first and foremost with you and your right. story and your ability to help direct people in the right direction to buy vitamins, whether they're going to buy them from you or some AI off of Amazon, but you are not selling vitamins as much as you are selling your wisdom around how to balance pharmaceuticals and nutritionals and a healthy lifestyle to make you be live, you know, eternally. Yeah, and and I mean, my my real expertise comes in understanding how these things are made. Uh, so I was a compounding pharmacist, and so I was a pharmacist. I, I created one of the uh, first accredited compounding pharmacies in the state. And what we did is we made medications from scratch for people that had specific health needs. So somebody that has allergies, somebody that um, uh, needs a special dose. You know, we were giving stuff to babies, to dogs. I think I made a suppository for like uh, like a huge animal. I think it was like a horse or something like that. We had to use a snow cone. Uh, as as like the mold, right? So like we've done crazy stuff. So I understand how a product needs to be made, how it needs to be tested, how to follow uh, federal regulations and be super compliant and the regulatory side of things. So you take all of the clinical expertise I have and you apply that with the um, the manufacturing expertise. And, and it's very simple to look at the, the supplement industry. And once you understand like the supply chain and those concerns, then you can sell, tell people that, listen, you want to buy supplements, but there are three different kinds of supplements. There's dangerous stuff, stuff that is, they, they don't even care about quality. They, that, these products can actually hurt you because of what they have in them. Then there's what I call the mediocre middle. These are just everything that you see everywhere. And what I tell people is if you want to get a mediocre supplement, then what you should do is just spend the least amount of money possible on it. Go to the, the Sam's Clubs of the world and buy one, get a pallet full for $3. Do that because there's no sense spending anything more than that because these things are just blah. They're just things, you know chemicals. They're, they're not going to really do anything for you. And and then what we all look for when we buy supplements is the best of the best. When I take turmeric, I want to make sure it works and it helps with my inflammation. And I want to take the right fish oil and the right dose. And people, unfortunately, are buying from column A and column B without knowing that whole picture because they don't understand the complexity of the supplement supply chain. And I think that's really where my story is going. And I think this is the big thing to say here is that if your podcast mission, Park, is to, to help people you know, with this story journey and, and, and building this, I'm a small guy. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just really at the beginning of all of this. And, and like, just even to ask me to be on this, it's a huge honor for me because I'm literally sitting in, in what I call the shoddy tree house, the upstairs of my, uh, my practice in Woodstock. And I'm, I'm doing this podcast with you. I just think that, you know, get out there, tell your story and just, and, and hone it down as best as you can, but know that it's an evolving thing that will always be changing. And that's, completely fine. That's how it's supposed to work. 
Yeah, I, great advice, and that's why I wanted to get you on the show because I saw how methodical you were when you first started working in the DIY workbook to start focusing your story. And then you and I jumped on a couple Zoom sessions, and then I didn't hear from you for a while, and I reached out said, you know, Neil, everything okay on that end? I said, well, I had some challenges on my pharmacy side, and you you have been very thoughtful about how you you put this together. Then to see you a year later, you know, sitting at the table there in a the lunchroom at Social Media Marketing World and hear where it's arrived at because you've even changed the name in this process and it looks like your story is really coming together. Yeah, I th- and I think that's that's the thing is that, you know, everybody's in a rush and and it's so easy, you know, here's the thing, it's so easy to to drop money on all of the consulting groups, right? That's what social media marketing is filled with is the people that are are all the agencies that'll grab up your money and then then throw some ads online. But the problem is is that if you don't know what your story is, all of that will be ineffective. If you don't know who you are and why you're different, you are literally just wasting money. And and so the idea of me taking that time to really focus on who we are, what are we trying to do, what makes us unique was the most important time. Even if it delayed all of this out, it, it was the most important thing that I did. Yeah. Well, and before we started recording here today, I mentioned to you, and I would like to share with our listeners, that we at Business of Story are going to kick off our eight-week deliberate practice program here in Phoenix on June 6th, Thursday, June 6th. And Neil, I invite you to come out for it because now you're at the perfect time to not only test and proof your story, but start adding and building the stories around it. And what we're doing with this eight-week deliberate practice program, been working with lots of different brands internally, I decided, and I've had a lot of people request it, to make a public course. So we're going to have a public cohort. It'll be from brands of all different genres, different sizes, different industries. We start with a half-day hands-on workshop where I walk through my, my three primary uh, story narratives to help you focus your brand story, find those sample example brand story or stories that support your brand, and then show you how to use the overall story cycle system for everything from brand strategy to narrative development to long form storytelling and to presentations. And then we go into six weeks of online learning. I use the great thinkific.com platform. I'll shoot out a assignment for you every Monday. That assignment will take you anywhere 10, 15 minutes. Some people jump in, they do it every single day, so they spend hours on it. But the idea is to use these frameworks in your business and on your business, you know, not only to help define your brand story, but maybe you've already got a brand story in place and you're just trying to get other people to buy into it. And then at the end of the eight-week deliberate practice program, I'll do an online Zoom session where we'll do it live, we'll answer questions, we'll share success stories, figure out where people have been falling down and how we can um, get everybody rising in the cohort together. And I'm so excited about it, Neil, because I've seen this work so well. It's not just enough to go out and try to knock out storytelling in a hurry and think you've got it. You got to practice it over and over again and take the time like you have with your brand story of really understanding it and using it and build that storytelling muscle. And that's what that whole eight week deliberate practice program is designed to do. Yeah. And I think that as I shared with you, uh, when you told me this, it's, it's very similar to me telling people to uh, change their diet. I can sit there and I can give them the tools and the expertise and, and the guidance and the framework. But if that person goes home and makes poor decisions six times a day, then it, it all for not. So really, it it takes that reinforcement. And I think it's so important to build a habit around story than anything. That's, that's the the key here is that in the early phases, it's, it's really just beating that drum, uh, building the story uh, that uh, is will make you the most successful with it. Yeah. And we, we default back to our old ways of communicating, which is typically driven by sort of lazy logic. And just we're assuming people are going to buy what we're selling them without doing the heavy lifting of starting with the end button. Therefore, our setup, right. the problem we're solving for and how we go about that. And, you know, Neil, I just want to thank you for being here because your story is great. And I'm, it's so much fun to watch it unfold. And I'll be curious to see where you are a year from now because you're taking such a unique approach to it that is uniquely your own. Thank you so much. And I look forward to meeting you at Social Media Marketing World. And maybe, just maybe, I'll have a little extra coin in my pocket. I can buy a dinner or something like that. (laughs) But we're only only eating salads. (laughs) That's right. (laughs) 
Well, thanks, man. And I'd like to thank you all for listening to this edition of the Business of Story. If you like what you heard today and you kind of share the same sort of sentiment that, man, it's messed up on both sides of the aisle, from the pharmaceutical side to the nutritional side, and you're looking for better guidance or you know of someone that's looking for better guidance, share this show with them. Share Neil's website, woodstockvitamins.com with them and learn from a guy that has really spent a lot of time, you know, understanding the medical side of it and now the nutritional side of it and bringing that all together. You know, certainly share this show, this episode with someone that can benefit. And if I can be of service to you to help supplement your business storytelling, you know where to find me, businessstory.com, waiting there with a ton of information, tips, techniques for you. And if you're interested in our deliberate practice program that starts here, it'll be in Phoenix beginning on June 6th. Just visit businessofstory.com. We'll have a button right on the homepage that you can learn more about it and register and know that we only have 60 seats available in this cohort. I found once we get over that number, it gets to be a little bit difficult to bring everybody together, but 60 seems like to be just the perfect number for doing this. So hope you'll join us. And remember, until next week, when we'll have another story artist on like Neil to help you craft and tell compelling stories that sell, that the most important story you're going to tell is the story you tell yourself. So make it a great one. Thanks for listening.